but yeah, as as the owner of two cockatiels, uh, the, the amount of bird <laughs> death in sci-fi is uh, is alarming to say the least. <laughs> What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? Dr. Sam Gregson, particle physicist here again. I hope you've had a brilliant week and have a fantastic weekend in store. Now, this week, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. We're going to be breaking down the science behind Netflix's latest science fiction series, The Three-Body Problem. The show follows Yi Wenji, an astrophysicist who sees her father beaten to death as part of a struggle session during the Chinese Cultural Revolution of the 1960s and 70s. Due to her scientific background, she is conscripted by the military and sent to a secret base in a remote location. There, she is tasked with communicating with whoever, or whatever, might be out there in the depths of our universe. Her work in the middle of the last century seems to have implications for a group of scientists known as the Oxford Five in the present day. But what those implications may be is yet to become clear. Today, we're going to dive into all the science we've seen so far in episode one. Note that we're only taking that episode in isolation. If the show addresses our concerns later, so be it. So to help me work out where scientific reality ends and science fiction begins, I'm joined by two brilliant special guests. Firstly, Professor Freya Blechman. Professor Blechman is a particle physicist at the University of Hamburg, and a visiting professor in Oxford and Brussels, and the lead scientist at DAISY, the German electron synchrotron. Professor Blechman and her team's research focuses on using the Large Hadron Collider to answer questions like, how did the universe evolve? What are the smallest constituents of matter? What is the nature of space and time? What is mass? And many, many more. Professor Blechman regularly appears in the media and is a superb science communicator. I highly recommend her Twitter feed, which is aimed at the technically inclined general public. Links are in the description. Secondly, I'm joined by Dr. Sam Horrell. Dr. Horrell is the Structural Biology Facility Manager at Imperial College London and was formerly a beamline scientist working at Diamond Light Source, the UK synchrotron, working in the Life Sciences Division. His work focuses on macromolecular X-ray crystallography with a particular interest in time-resolved structural biology. He was the one to flag up the three-body problem's questionable particle physics, and I just couldn't resist following up on his excellent Twitter threads, which are down in the description. So I couldn't hope for two better guests to join this three-body discussion and to set the science right. So there's quite a lot of science in episode one of the three-body problem. Indeed, the episode focuses uh, quite a bit on particle physics. So I want to get you both involved as quickly as I can, straight at the top. What do you make of the science behind episode one of the three-body problem? And what was your most irritating bugbear? Sam, maybe if I come to you, because you flagged this up specifically as a <laughs> an irritating bugbear, and I can give you a, an image to help you out with this. <laughs> yeah, so as, as a structural biologist, uh, I am constantly seeing DNA be depicted <laughs> uh, as like this perfectly symmetrical kind of wave like this. Um, whereas in reality, uh, as you can see here, what it has is uh, a major and a minor groove. So it's not actually symmetrical. It kind of, because of the way the amino acids kind of, well, the way the bases uh, line up, it goes sort of in this much more swooshy motion. But yeah, every single depiction of DNA you will see on television <laughs> is always this uh, perfectly symmetrical and although it's a very minor part of this show like yeah as soon as dna like comes on the screen my partner will kind of turn to me and i'll almost immediately go yeah that's wrong i like it it shows it shows that you're being eagle-eyed this is a sort of attention to detail that we're going to be uh you know dealing with today so that's that's excellent freya what 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 sparked your uh your interest was it was it maybe uh some of the event displays was it maybe uh People saying they look through the CERN code in sort of five minutes. What was uh, anything? Yeah, that, that will do it. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> simply, but yeah, of course, there's also a lot of artistic license. I think. Of course. Uh, I I spoke to some colleagues as well and uh, uh, had some coffee and tea with some of the with people. And the main pet peeve besides that, yeah, like the science is up for some artistic license. Of but course. Claiming that scientists 
uh, stop working when they don't understand things is, is really <laughs> quite offensive. <laughs> this that, is exactly that was a bit that really for. got like, me. We, yeah. lo- we, we love this. The more we don't understand something, the better. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. No, I com- I completely agree. That was uh, that was very odd, and we're going to come on to that one specifically. For me, I've got to say it's anything that you know puts Oxford ahead of uh, Cambridge. You know, I'm not going <laughs> to like that. So, uh, you know, as soon as we start seeing this, I'm uh, you know I'm, I'm asking questions. You know, is this a feeder ring for the much larger <laughs> larger Cambridge uh, particle accelerator? You know, what's uh, what's going on here? I've got to ask. So yeah, maybe if- this this was also sort of an immediate thing for me. Yeah. Also. Having worked at multiple particle accelerators now, whenever you would say to someone in the general public, I work at a particle accelerator, their immediate response is, oh, is it like CERN? And unfortunately, Diamond, which is the Oxford University particle accelerator, Mm -hmm. is very much not like CERN, which I'm sure we'll get into. (laughs) That's exactly what we're going to come into now. So, Sam, uh, one of the first locations we visit in the show is this Oxford University particle physics accelerator. So... Um, this facility seems to be billed as a an ultra powerful particle collider working mm-hmm. at the uh, the cutting edge of high energy physics. So, does this place exist? You mentioned there. What what machine are we actually looking at? And uh, I believe it's one that you're intimately familiar with, actually. Yes, I mean this this picture it actually it is Diamond. Like this is Diamond Light Source uh, in sort of South Oxfordshire uh, near Harwell. So. It is it is a real building, and they've even got sort of a quite up to date model of it with like these extra little mm. pods mm. all around the outside of it. Um, so yeah, they've obviously they're obviously aware that Diamond does in fact exist. Maybe we've got the ominous the... darkness though, right? It has to be in the dark, <laughs> otherwise it's uh, you know it looks a little bit too uh, friendly and welcoming. So we've mm. got to add the uh, it's yeah, got to be at I mean, night. Don't... Yeah, yeah. So Diamond, Diamond is, is a twenty four hour user facility. So it it there are people working on at Diamond in the dark. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's. Uh, so so yeah. how how does this how does this uh, machine work? Um, maybe if I come to Freya, bring you bring you in. How does how does this synchrotron work? What what is its uh, what is its job and what are they trying to achieve there? So well, synchrotrons and uh, like any uh, circular accelerator, uh, they make particles go into the circle. And the specific thing about the synchrotron is how it accelerates the particles, and that it sort of adjusts to the speed of the particles, which is what a synchrotron, the synchro part of it, is. It synchronizes with the particles going in the circle in a very clever way. Um, synchrotron also has to do with radiation, which is the uh, uh, the fact that these accelerators they actually admits x-rays or uh, gamma rays sometimes even, so very strong uh, light, which is why they're called light sources and why Sam also already mentioned the word light source, because that light we can use. And this is actually one of the most common uses of accelerators in the world around us, is to use the light that comes from accelerators to do all sorts of really, really great science. And it goes from uh watching how molecules work uh, taking photos of paintings to see the hidden layers behind the paintings and all sorts of stuff for which you can use this x-ray light because this mm. is an accelerator is a really really good source of x-ray so so i think you use this in some of your work sam right so i think the idea is here where we're accelerating this beam of particles around this ring when they accelerate around a ring they emit this synchrotron radiation and then we can guide that synchrotron radiation it kind of you can imagine the particles going round, and it fans out into these uh, these kind of modules here, where you can do certain experiments, and and we can look at different things with this uh, with these X rays um, with this X ray radiation. What what sort of work were you doing there, Sam? And what were you looking at? Uh, so I mean, I, I was working specifically in sort of the life sciences side of things, which I think surprises a lot of people when when you say like I work at a particle accelerator, and then they're like, oh, what do you do? I I'm a biologist. Um, <laughs> a lot of people are kind of taken back by that because I guess. Mm. I mean, even like when when synchrotrons first came about, like um, it was particle physicists trying to sort of investigate how the electrons were accelerated and all that sort of stuff. And the the X-rays that actually came off were kind of an, an irritation to them. It was yeah. just like, why why is this uh, 
here messing with my signal or whatever. For us high the energy, only... high energy people, obviously this is <clears throat> something that that caps the energy of a of a you know a discovery machine, a high energy machine. So yeah. a lot yeah. of people when they when they hear about synchrotron radiation, this is a this is a bad thing, something that's stopping us yeah. getting to the highest energy of these particles excel um, going around the ring. But in this case, we actually want to use that light. It's a it's a it's a product rather than a you know something where yeah, uh, we're exactly. bothered by. So like your your first generation synchrotrons were just accelerating the electrons and sort of studying how the electrons were interacting, how they were working, and then second generation synchrotrons came along. Uh, the first one actually being Darsbury, which is up in the north of England, um, and they that's one of the first ones that was actually dedicated to using the synchrotron radiation for experiments. So the, the really great thing about synchrotrons and light sources like diamond uh, is all of these beam lines, uh, the little uh, bits jutting out, so the number four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, each one of those can be doing a, a unique experiment. So for my side of things, it was life sciences. So we were doing uh, protein crystallography. So fire an x-ray at a protein, uh, the, the crystal scatters the light and produces a diffraction pattern. And from that diffraction pattern, you can solve a molecular structure and figure out what a protein looks like, how it works and stuff like that. Um, but then on the other side of the ring, there's people doing sort of tomography, uh, looking at like airplane turbines and how they react to stress, like looking at micro fractures that mm. form. Uh, there's like loads of battery research, there's physical sciences, material sciences. So like Diamond has, uh, I think it's 32 different beam lines and nice. all of them work at the same time doing different experiments. So like the the output of a, of a facility like this is massive. Like it really enables a lot of interesting science. Amazing. So I think the important thing to add is that these particles only admit, admit these emit these x-rays when they go around the corner. So yeah. mm. for us, uh, using circular accelerators is actually, a, they're a nuisance. And this is why <laughs> circular analysis are not circular. So they tend to be like sort of, uh, well, a diamond actually is a good example because it has many angles because at each of these angles, you want to have as many photons there yeah. as possible. Yeah. We are trying to also maximize this at CERN to make sure that we get as little fucked on this possible. Yeah, so we've got we've got this interplay between yeah. what what they're kind of presenting in the show is that this is. Uh, it seems to me that they're trying to get across that this is a really high energy particle collider. We see we see particles coming in and smashing together. They look like they're maybe looking for Higgses. There's pictures of CMS, which we're going to come on to, which is obviously a an LHC experiment. So they're trying to get across that this is a high energy particle collider, but actually. They're trying to do something that is almost exactly opposite with this machine. <laughs> Amazing science, but it's it's not a collider. It's something mm. where we're we're trying to get that synchrotron radiation off and trying to take advantage of it rather than seeing it as a nuisance as we as we uh, usually do at a at a high energy machine. So yeah, it's, I mean, um, like we're. We, we even install like specific arrays of magnets, which make even more synchrotron radiation. So like, the picture <laughs> you've got up at the moment is uh, is a bending magnet. So yeah. that's actually a fairly used for fairly low flux beam lines. So like photons per second is a measure of flux. So for a bending magnet, because it kind of makes, like you see in this picture, sort of a wide scatter of um, X-rays, that then gets fed into the beam lines, which then have their own optics hutches and stuff like that to shape and uh, sculpt the beam to whatever they're looking for. But then the newer generation uh, uses undulators and wigglers, which is like, um, a regular array of like plus minus magnets and that effectively makes the bunch of electrons go like this ah, okay so gets even more instead out, of right, okay. a wide change of direction they're doing sort of a constant wiggle and that causes the x-rays to sort of build up in phase with each other and then you get an even more intense x-ray beam as somebody so who's only on... worked at the LHC trying to get to high energy, I can't, like, my brain is struggling <laughs> to, like, you know, take in that we're trying to waste all this energy. Yeah, it's I see like it adding a yeah. cane to the yeah. to <laughs> to make them go slower, to slow them down, to get these extra photons. Yeah, but... It's like the worst thing there is for us, yeah. right? You don't want to do that. Exactly. <laughs> but then well, for at the same time, diamond... for light sources, is exactly what you want to do. Mm. Yeah, yeah exactly. for diamond, we're topping up the electrons every yeah. uh, 10 minutes. Mm. So we're... Constantly working at about 300 milliamps, and then every there's like a little monitor for the um, <clears throat> the energy of the beam, and yeah, every 
every 10 minutes you'll see just a little spike and it will just go back up so we're just constantly pushing more electrons back in and then we've got the rf cavities the radio frequency cavities to pump energy back into the yeah. electrons so I, I think it's about between four to ten hours a bunch of electrons will stay circulating wow. and they'll be constantly topped up and so sort of like when you're in playing mario kart and you go over that little booster ring like the rf cavity is just like that little jump of speed to keep the electrons yeah. circulating so I have some challenges, Sam. Maybe if we we just we just clear this off. So, so mm -hmm. here is a nice image from the show, which uh, seems to show <laughs> somebody, uh, one of the characters, wandering along um, the beam line here at uh, at Diamond Light. Um, like I said, I have some challenges with this. Does it does it mm -hmm. look accurate? Did they? I guess they didn't take footage actually in the in the tunnel for the show. It looks a little no, bit I mean, AI looks... and <clears throat> yeah, this looks pretty CGI'd. But yeah. I mean, like the. So you can see sort of on the blue magnet there, like um, you can see four quadrants of magnets. So yeah. around the ring, we do have these quadrupole magnets and they're effectively, because um, we've got bunches of electrons circulating, obviously all the electrons together want to push away from each other because they're all negatively charged. So the, the magnets like the sextapole and the quadrupole sort of keep forcing those bunches to, to stay together. Yeah. So they've got, a quadrupole there but it doesn't for one thing it's really long like most quadrupoles are a lot shorter i can i think we've got an actual image sort of here from yeah so this is a, a picture i took of the uh of the actual inside of diamond <clears throat> so the red magnets there are quadrupoles and then the, the yellow ones are sextopoles so they're they're sort of there to shape and sculpt the beam mm. or the electron beam and then that green one is a, a bending magnet. So like the one that caused the sort of wide yeah. swath of x-rays. And then I think you can't really see it, but a bit further back that way, um, there'll be an, an undulator which feeds into that other beam pipe, which you can see just behind. So so, they, so they've yeah, got, they've got some of the big ideas. You can see a flip there, yeah. So uh, Sorry, Frey, you wanted to come in there. Yeah, I was just, go I was just uh, uh, saying that he had a nice photo. Thanks, so indeed, you could see the two different beams where you could actually put new particles in or take them out. And, and, yeah, and, so and, yeah. and Freya, you mentioned that that you know there's obviously going to be a lot of artistic license in the science. We're not trying to you know shred all of the science, but you said it might look like something from the 1970s. What did you what did you yeah. pick up on? So I think well, like I've seen a lot of particle physics photos, and I think when they did the CGI, this is the photo that they used as inspiration. Right. Uh, which is a very famous photo, but it's also a photo from the SPS, the Synco. Super Synco Proton Synchrotron, Synchrotron, is it? Super Proton Synchrotron, which was an accelerator that indeed ran in the 1970s, and then it was really the cutting edge mm. uh, in the 1980s. But this now is the one, one that the discovered accelerators of the LHC. Discovered yeah. the W and Z, right? Was it in the exactly? 1990s? Which, by the way, has it has had their anniversary last that's year. That's right. So, that's right. Uh, yeah. So that gives you some idea of how long ago. <laughs> so, uh, so this so, is a feeder so ring, that, the final feeder ring for the the current LHC. So to get the protons up to and previously, yeah, and previously it was the world's highest accelerator, but mm. uh, high energy accelerator. But that was in the 1970s and <laughs> So, but I do think that that's what this yeah. photo was inspired by. It does yeah, look. It does it looks, look very close, yeah. doesn't it? If we, it looks yeah, like they've taken exactly. that and fed it into AI and be yeah. like, "Make me an image." We need some chunkier boys in here. Yeah. Where they need to be a yeah. bit bigger. For uh, higher energy yeah. means bigger. So they've. they've yeah, like how? Just... How does someone get in to work on those? <laughs> like, because there's no uh, gap between anything. Like in in the, uh, in the show one. image, like there's absolutely yeah. no room to work anywhere in there. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Connecting one uh, one accelerator magnet to the other is actually a very difficult business, as I'm sure yeah. you know. So indeed, you need space there. Uh, also, because these are all like super conducting and cool and well, fancy mm. in many different ways, and so you need all these services to also go into the magnet. So indeed, there's uh, quite a lot of artistic license, but I still think it's interesting that we managed to sort of pinpoint where they got the inspiration from mm. which i think is is cool no, i think i think um, i think you've nailed yeah. it with that picture yeah. really if you skip back mm. and forward it really does look kind of yeah. like sam said they've just kind of taken that and fed it through uh, a little bit of an ai 
program. Freya, I had a little, another little problem with this, and, and I'm sure Sam can comment on this for, for Diamond Light specifically, that um, as Vera Yi wanders down um, this, uh, this beam tunnel, machinery humming, it seems to be on at least to some extent. Um, when we get to the control room, the other character is watching collisions happen, apparently in real time. So our, our character is wandering down the tunnel while this thing is apparently making these high energy collisions. Any thoughts on that, Freya? Yeah, no bueno. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, let's just say, let's just be fair. Uh, accelerators, when they run, you can't get to it. We have like yeah. hundreds of security systems that are set up in place specifically to prevent that. Uh, an accelerator, in some sense, like I said, is a very fancy X-ray machine. Yeah. And just like at the dentist, uh, uh, you can control when it's on and off, and you're not supposed to be next to it when it's on unless there's a very specific reason. And then it's set up in such a way that you're safe. So a running accelerator, you should not be walking next to, <laughs> and that's a very big artistic license that that's okay. Um, and to be fair, even if an accelerator is not running, you should probably not just be walking around it very mm -hmm. close without uh, any safety measures because these tunnels, there, the accelerator or the yeah, the magnets in there, they tend to be cooled uh, with all sorts of liquid gases. And those gases, when they evaporate, they more or less can push all the oxidant, yeah. uh, oxygen out of the tunnel. So when we work there, typically, unless these are very, very special tunnels with really, really great ventilation, we actually more or less have to have our own little scuba gear with us, just in case there's a gas leak. <clears throat> so there's quite a... a, a there's quite a lot of uh, poetic license here. Um, <laughs> it's a cool, uh, it's a great video. Don't get me wrong. I really <laughs> like the story, but uh, uh, just take that into account. So no, you can't go to an accelerator like that. So there's a couple of problems here. So, so firstly, if this is a high energy particle collider, as they're portraying, nobody should be down there. There's a lot of radiation coming out that's dangerous. And as you said, there's there's potential for gas leaks. Nobody's allowed to just kind of roam around the LHC tunnel mm -hmm. while it's working. That's not a thing. Also... The control room seems to be only accessible along the tunnel, which is bizarre. You have to sort of wander along the tunnel to get to the control, which is not a thing. It's all control from the kind of surface, and then you you go down for maintenance. Sam, at, at, at Diamond Light, does can you go in the tunnel while it's while it's operating? I'm still guessing uh, not. Lots of synchrotron radiation, X rays. Yeah, not um, not while it's operating. It sounds like it is quite <coughs> different to the LHC because you can when it's when the machine is off. You, you can go into it's it's called zone 13 so 12 zones around and then 13 is the middle zone where you go into sort of the linear accelerator the booster ring and the storage ring um so so yeah you, you can actually at diamond go into there when it's in shutdown um in fact when it's in shutdown they normally have open days um so I, i've given tours mm -hmm. inside uh diamond um and you get to show people all the magnets and stuff so um yeah i guess in that respect you you can walk around without any protective gear as long as the machine is off um when the machine is on you obviously can't go in so it's um the whole machine is enclosed in massive concrete walls uh, you have to go through this big chicane to get into the booster ring uh into the um storage ring as well um and nobody's trapped um, in the middle in the control room while it's operating, right? You can't, you're not just <laughs> no, like... the control room is actually, so there's like, um, there's a building called Diamond House and then there's a bridge over a road to the synchrotron and the control room for the, the actual machine is just over that bridge. Yeah. But then for each individual beam line, you have your own control hutch. Um, so you'll, yeah. if you go back to that um, schematic of the synchrotron that you have. Yes. Um, uh this one yeah that's the one yeah so number six will be like your optics hutches so you'll your x-rays will come in raw off the um off the sink off the uh storage ring you'll have something maybe like a, a monochromator or some lenses or some mirrors which mm. will either like select maybe a single wavelength for you or something like that and then some like slits to get the beam down to a certain size or mirrors to focus it down to a certain size uh, then seven is actually the um, the experimental hutch. So this is where X-rays will hit your sample, and then eight is where we actually sit and ah, control it. Yeah. So well off to the side, not not just hidden in the middle here somewhere, trapped yeah. within a, in a, well, a rig of X-rays. 
Yeah. For, yeah. for the most but part. That, yeah. Control yeah. rooms tend to be sort of in the middle of accelerators, though. And mm. the reason for that is so you can talk to all parts of accelerators sort of at the same speed. Somebody actually won mm. a Nobel Prize for having the idea that you should be at the same distance <laughs> everywhere so that you can Amazing. control your accelerator problem. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for the most part, like well, well shielded, in... though, we should say at this point, right? <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if you if you're working on the beam lines, like we don't really have any control over the machine. The machine is just running, and it produces X rays for us. And then, from like six onwards, uh, the beam line scientists would have their control of their beam line. Yeah. But for the most part, the the central control room controls sort of one, two, and three, and we we just take the X rays that come off and yeah use them for our own purposes i mean i guess it's it's kind of similar to the to the lhc frame right where the individual experiments have control of their individual subunits and things but the central running of the proton collisions is controlled from the lhc control. yeah there's e even an us versus them uh, so i'm on shift this <laughs> afternoon so i hope they will give me one collision <laughs> <laughs> Right. So talking of that, Fred, there was a, an image when I was watching. This is how I knew, you know, this I knew you were the person for the job as soon as I, uh, you know, saw saw this image. So um, there's a very fancy picture here hung on the wall as uh, Vera Yi walks to the control room. Um, why does this not quite fit? What are we seeing on the screen here and why does it not quite fit with this being, you know, diamond light, the Oxford uh, particle physics accelerator. So this is a picture uh, that was is actually a very famous picture yet again. So uh, the show did do they did do their homework as far as finding famous particle physics pictures. So it's a yep. picture of the compact muon solenoid or CMS. Yeah. Uh, this is the experiment I work on and that I help build. Uh, it took us 25 years to build, <laughs> so this is a lot of work. And um, it is the best looking LHC experiment. Like it is by, by far, far the best far. looking experiment. Yeah. So we get uh, very often we are the LHC or sometimes also other experiments. So we're aware of that. So I totally understand why they picked it because it's beautiful. And uh, Michael Hawk, who is the artist and yeah. photographer yeah. and a physicist who took this photo, shoot, deserves a lot of credit for this fantastic photo. Um, it is really a picture of CMS. It's actually scaled down. It looks like it's a maybe one in ten scale picture. CMS is really big, eh? so normally it's ten meters. That distance from the left of the right to the screen. And uh, what you see is the different layers of these detectors, and each of them have a different role. And some of these we'll discuss later because these are things like the calorimeter and uh, yeah. the muon system and all those uh, different detectors. So you can sort of see it's a bit an onion-like structure each. Each layer does something else. And the particles, they are produced in the center of the detector, which is, of course, a projection. Because in the real life, this is a 3D thing that's built around the collision point. And uh, each layer detects the particles in a different way or stops them or lets them go through. And all of that, in the end, allows allow us to reconstruct what really happened at the collision. So this is this is an LHC experiment. So this is an experiment yes. at the very highest energies. These protons mm -hmm. coming in, smashing yeah. together at you know ten TeV plus, maybe producing Higgs bosons, producing high energy physics. Why does that not really tally with uh, the size of this machine and this this machine, this synchrotron here at uh, at Oxford? Why? Why is there a I mismatch really in the wish we here? would make high energy machines that were so small. It would be fantastic. <laughs> it, it, it would be, this would solve so many problems. Yeah. Um, uh, high energy machines, a lot of the space is taken by the acceleration and by the fact that every time you go around the corner, you lose the acceleration. So yeah. you're continuously balancing those two things. And this is why these high energy accelerators are so big. Yeah. Uh, because they're just, in some sense, uh, machines that are. Uh, that need so really cutting edge technology, and sometimes the cutting edge technology is just big. So we're still working on making it smaller, mm. and this is an active research field to actually make smaller accelerators. And people are working on this, but this is ten to twenty to maybe even fifty years away before we can do things uh, to that size. So that also means, indeed, that for the future, if we need an accelerator before that, we'll actually need to go bigger. And you put on the right uh, photo there already. Uh, <laughs> and bigger means at the moment still actually going bigger. And this is what this famous future circular collider, which uh, the FCC uh, is the idea. Because at the moment, the technology does not exist yet 
to go smaller. Mm -hmm. I wish it would. It would make things cheaper <laughs> because most of the cost of an accelerator is actually the tunnel. Yeah. Uh, it would make things cheaper because most of the cost is actually the magnets. So you mm -hmm. need fewer of them and they would be smaller. So everything would be easier if it could be done this small. So, so, so in that case, let's hope this is science fiction and we will figure out how to do this very soon. So this would be good. So 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 again, yeah. we've got this kind of mismatch here, haven't we, where they're trying to project that this is basically a CERN-like high energy particle collider in Oxford, but the machine that they're, where, where you would want to minimize those synchrotron losses to keep the particles accelerating quickly uh, and going around at high speed, but they're presenting a much smaller synchrotron. And if you had something this small, the angles that they're going around are obviously much tighter. The, the tracks are much tighter. You're gonna lose a lot more synchrotron radiation. So the idea that you could create a particle collider at the cutting edge, cutting frontiers of energy, this small, we we simply can't do it at the moment. So it, it's there's a lot of license going into, uh, a lot of artistic license going into what we see here. Sam, did you want to jump in there? Um, yeah, because I mean, there, there are smaller colliders, right, where they have like two linear ones like this, which then meet in the middle of a ring. Um, I guess that's maybe an older generation of colliders. And then like CERN is kind of the new shiny toy i don't know i i as not a particle physicist i don't know a whole lot about them yeah. i i just uh in my thread that brought about this conversation where i said synchrotrons don't really collide stuff um some physicists immediately corrected me and like, no, no, synchrotrons do collide stuff uh, yeah. so, yeah. no there are many differences it also depends on what the the question is that you're trying to answer uh, mm. there's not just one collider in the world there's tens of thousands mm. colliders colliders in the world going from synchrotrons used for medical research most big hospitals nowadays have some form of collider for that mm. uh, all the way to the large hadron collider and uh, it depends this is a tool it depends on what you want to do with it um, if you need very intense but not very high energy beams a, a scenario like what you just said that would work then you could work with two linear colliders that then collide like that if you need both intensity and high energy, this the LHC style mechanics is at the moment more or less the only way we can go. More or less because the big trick here is that the particles keep going around. So you don't collide all of them mm. each time, right? Most of them keep going in the circle and they can collide the next time they're around, they go around. And that gives you a lot more potential for intensity than if you have a linear collider where the particles can only go through it once and then you're done. Mm. I think the only problem here is that they kind of wanted to have it both, right? They wanted to have the the nice, sexy picture of the Oxford Particle Collider. I'll bring it back up. And they wanted to suggest that it was cutting edge, highest energy, which you can't have both. But, you know, most people yeah. don't realize that. So it's fine. You know, it's fine. It's also based after book, right? So yeah, exactly. I don't I have not read the book. So maybe they were bound by that. Yeah, quite yeah, possibly. I guess they refer to them as the Oxford Five, don't they? So yeah. just... They, uh, Which sounds like some sort of, you know, wrongly me. convicted criminal yeah. gang, to be fair, but, you know, <laughs> rather than a group of particle physics. But yes, exactly. They're constrained to some extent by the uh, by the book. In terms of powering, <coughs> Sam, the um, the diamond light, I, th I think they say in the show, um, enough electricity to power a small town required for this collider. Mm. Now, for CERN, or if they're saying this is a very high energy machine, that would be far too low. How much power does diamond use? I believe it's two to three uh, is it megawatts, um, something on it. There's a statistic on the diamond website, which is 2,500 homes. Right. Yeah, that's probably um, sounds about right. I, don't I know think it's sort of, of a... whatever, 10 or 100 times less than what CERN uses. So power for a small town sounds that sounds about right, right? A couple of thousand homes that yeah, doesn't I, seem. Too I think far. I got that one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Happy with that one. Mm -hmm. So that one's that one's fairly decent, unless they're trying to say it's a high energy machine, and then if then we go off to CERN, we're talking about <laughs> yeah, basically the half of the power required for Geneva, which is you know huge. Yeah, system. but Geneva is also not a big town. Just remember that Geneva had two hundred thousand inhabitants. I always thought it was bigger. Maybe I was maybe yeah. I was overestimating. Then okay, so we'll we'll buy that. Not not too far off. In in the show, um, Freya. So Joven Adepu's character Sol uh, Sol Durant. He's uh, lamenting the fact that this uh, Oxford University particle accelerator is going to be turned off at midnight. So 
Would it be possible just to pull the plug on a particle accelerator? Thoughts on that? Well, yes and no. Um, if you don't pay your electricity <laughs> bill, you get cut off. This is also true for us. Uh, but we do pay our electricity bill. We negotiate yeah. a long time in advance uh, to make sure that that is happening, of course. Uh, CERN, there's, uh, a lot of, it, there's a lot of discussions with uh, EDF about the, the power exactly. of the collider, right? So CERN gets, gets their power from the French uh, grid, so from EDF, the Energie de France. And they uh, actually, indeed, we need to negotiate with the price just like everybody else. And uh, this can be difficult. And yes, of course, we ask for discounts. And yes, of course, we don't always get them. <laughs> They're probably yeah. not going to just Some cut us off one afternoon, of their... though. No, 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 no. But of course, accelerators do end yeah. their runtime when they're no longer scientifically viable for yeah. usually reasons that there's a better accelerator or just because we have done the science that we want to do with them. Mm. They do get shut down. Typically, they're reused, though. You saw this before with the SPS mm. uh, yeah. uh, accelerator. It's now used as a pre-accelerator in the yeah. whole chain of uh, accelerators. So, just completely turning it off and not reusing it is rare, but turning things off does happen. Uh, an example you have here, indeed, just last <coughs> year, um, one of the, uh, it's not exactly an accelerator, this is a tokamar. So this is uh, Fusion Research, which is a very similar facility, uh, uh, by the way, close to Oxford. Mm. Yes, uh, and The current European tokamak was shut down after 40 years of running, just because indeed, well, hmm. they were done. Yeah. Even though they might not agree with what they But then that... you need to get somebody from uh, from Jet. I'm not gonna <laughs> Yeah, we can't we can't comment too much <laughs> on that. And and Sam, I think you said shutting down Diamond would be would be tough as well. Obviously CERN, a massive place, lots of people mm. who rely on it, but but Diamond as well, I think you said ten thousand users all around the world, eight hundred yeah, staff. I mean... This is something that, that's used all over the world by different researchers. Yeah, I mean in terms of just like cutting the power like i have actually been in diamond when there was a power cut like um yes the whole like all the lights went off and like the whole the whole building kind of sighed like because all the motors Magnus. and pumps and stuff all powered down at once and the whole thing kind of just went mm. and then all the lights went out and then i think about 10 minutes later it all came back up um but the, the moment the lights went out and the machine side, you could almost hear every single beamline scientist around the ring just going, ah! <laughs> because and... essentially the whole thing requires so many different motors that keep mirrors in certain places. And like, if you just cut power, yeah, everything kind of sags and yeah. it just kind of, everything gets misaligned and you have to, spend possibly a couple of days realigning everything to make sure it uh, stays up. Uh, in that case, we did have um, emergency power, which meant damage was minimized. But yeah, just, just turning off a particle accelerator can ruin you for like potentially weeks or months if it's really bad. Like if the emergency power didn't come back on, Diamond might not have been able to continue its run. So. Diamond kind of works in um, runs and shutdowns. So we'll have like a couple of months run and then we'll go into a controlled shutdown where we'll turn everything off. People can go into the ring, do maintenance. Yeah. I mean, Very even, similar to said. Very similar. even once a week. So we have machine day where you turn off the accelerate, where you stop it generating x-rays. You keep most of the stuff on and then people can go in and do maintenance or uh, that that picture I showed of the um, of inside the magnets. That's actually where they've um, uh, there's you can see just to the left and right. There's these big concrete blocks, and there's um, cranes that go all the way around the ring, and they lift off the concrete blocks, and you can you know bring in new bits of kit or whatever. So that's when they were doing some maintenance, and they needed access from above. So like you obviously can't take those blocks off while the machine's running, but in in like a longer shutdown you can take these blocks off and you can you know drop in a new bit of kit or whatever um so yeah diamond can fairly easily be go into shutdown but that, that's very different to just killing the power um and i, I guess Freya, at, at CERN, when the lhc is running if we if there's a power cut or there's some fault that happens there's 
the beams are dumped into long tunnels with yeah. a huge block of the concrete. The beams are dumped, but we keep the accelerator on. It has its mm. own emergency mm. aggregates. This is particularly relevant for because we have superconducting magnets, so they're mm. slightly different than the magnets that yeah. uh, that Diamond has, and these actually get damaged if they yeah. turn off abruptly, and mm. so we don't want that to happen. So things tend to be a bit more secured because of that reason, but we also have power outages. Uh, yeah. Just uh, like you, Sam, I've been in cases, mm. we have thunderstorms here in summer that are <laughs> severe enough that there are power outages, and of course, also other things. There's a famous LAT weasel that uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, ate the cable, and then we didn't have power for a week. <laughs> so these things happen. Uh, and mm. But yeah, then you fix things and keep going. It's not the same as mm. shutting up, right? That was uh, one of the most stressful um, stressful afternoons of my life. There was uh, I was at a barbecue <laughs> in... Uh, at CERN and uh, there was a, a lightning strike and then of course the phone goes two seconds later you know everything is shut down on the LHCB rich come and fix it oh my god had to go <laughs> go downstairs restart a load of computers with some ancient book where all the pages were falling out somehow managed to do it but mm. I don't think I've ever been yeah. more stressed in my life so yes that is yeah. uh I mean, there has actually been uh, small critters that were actually quite useful for synchrotrons. Um, so there was a, a ferret called Felicia, <laughs> and they used to use her to clean the beam pipe. Ah, yes, that's the true. Characters. So they'd yeah. attach a little um, cleaner to her, and she'd run through the beam pipe, dragging <laughs> it behind her, and it would clean the beam pipe. If if you look up Felicia, Felicia the ferret, ferret, ferret uh, you should find... Uh, a nice picture of her. Apparently she was stuffed after she died, but no one seems to know where she ended up. Yeah, this is indeed. There's quite a lot of these sort of stories and because indeed cleaning these pipes is not so easy. Um, there's also tricks with like fluffy balls and vacuum cleaners mm. at one end. And, yeah, uh, I think they've developed uh, yeah. ways now that don't require a ferret to, <laughs> to clean them, but for the most part they're kept in like high vacuum and you know, you 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 try to never open up the beam pipes to expose them to dust or whatever. But yeah, apparently ferret used to be the the preferred method of cleaning. Amazing stuff. These are the you only get these stories in uh, in particle physics stuff. Excellent, amazing. So Freya, I want to uh, to come on to this because this was this was the big thing in the in the show that kind of sparked my interest. So. In the show, we're shown a very interesting particle collision event display that is described as uh, impossible and Alice in Wonderland and uh, indicates that particle physics experiments around the globe are now producing nonsensical output. So what are we seeing here? Maybe I can get a, a little bit of a clearer image. I think they've got... Um, yeah, that's exactly. So one thing which I think is interesting is that it's the same collision every time. And every collision we yes. make is different. And we that's make 40 billion per second. Of <laughs> but let's not even that, let's forgive them for that uh, artistic life. Mm. So obviously the graphics team in the TV show did a really good job and actually did do their research uh, to start and then pimp things. So what happened was there is a collision there, the green lines. They actually look relatively realistic if you see them like this standing still. The issue that there actually is, is that normally when you have a collision, these particles then behave in a certain way because of the magnetic field. Yeah. And instead what they're doing is they're rotating the green lines while not rotating the beam. So this is what, what makes it look very strange to us. So that's what makes it look unphysical. They're rotating something while not rotating, rotating the rest of it while there is a magnetic field. Uh, so that's the green light. They're also obviously uh, inspired by, yet again, uh, I think some quite famous collisions from quite a while ago that I think are the most realistic, for example, some of these, which again are related to the SPS. So maybe their whole theme was to sort of go with these um, yeah. kind of collisions. So I'm giving them some uh, uh, props here for trying to at least stick to the theme of their accelerator yeah. that they were using before and then showing collisions that are very similar. Um, the red lines, on the other hand, <laughs> you're a so, so I had some problems with this. Yeah. So, so you mentioned magnetic fields. So just for people who are watching or not, or not as sort of clued in on particle physics. So the protons come in here, they smash together. Maybe we can, uh, I think I've got a quick video clip of kind of what happens. So what they show in the show. So... The protons come in, they smash together, and then we get this uh, this output. So 
The protons come in, they smash together, they disappear in a kind of ball of energy, and then all of these particles come out. But the detector that they go into, as Freya said, is is full of these magnetic fields. Those magnetic fields make the particles bend, and then you can determine the sign of their charge from that bending. But the red ones here, Freya, they seem to bend one way, and then they bend the other way. So we have this kind of maximum, and then they come back the other way. So they seem to change charge kind of while they're flying that that, that sort of well that piqued could, my interest what could be the case is that they're sort of circular in the uh circling in the magnetic field so and because okay. you're looking at the projection we're looking the at thing it wrong, that's, yeah. uh, that is confusing here is the fact that half of the image is rotating half of it is not rotating and they're trying to present it as one thing yeah so <laughs> like i said the green stuff i believe the red stuff by itself you could it could be believable yeah. Uh, together, not believable. <laughs> well, I guess they did say that they were making nonsensical results, so they have achieved their goal of making yeah. a nonsensical exactly. result. Exactly. So that's that's what, that's what I th I thought they were trying to say. You know, this is accurate, but it's just you know it's curving one way and then the other, and that doesn't conserve charge. It seems to change charge in flight. So that that makes no sense. That that was kind of how I read it. And if they, like you said, if they wanted to get that across then yeah, I was like, that looks like nonsense to me. So yeah, science okay, is broken. <laughs> okay, I guess. All right. So it looks, yeah, like we said, kind of like a, you know, a particle physics, um, you know, diagram, uh, particle physics collision. So here's one from CMS. You know, you can kind of see the same ideas with the particles coming out and then they curve in the magnetic fields, maybe inspired by some older event displays, maybe from UA1 at SPS, um, like you said. So, yeah, not not too bad, and certainly gets across that that physics is uh, broken, quote unquote. Now it's impressive they've managed to get this result to display so nicely on their phone. That's true. No, yeah. no, no. This all, for us is uh, like I said, these uh, event displays run online. If we indeed are taking data this afternoon, anyone can check the data of the LAC on their phone. These event displays are live and public. Yeah, fair oh, enough. Well, if you have a browser, yeah. you can watch them. Fair enough. So they mentioned in here as well, um, Freya, that all of the particle, maybe we've covered this, all of the accelerators are producing this nonsense. I guess that doesn't really make sense because there's so many different types of particle accelerators around the world. If we're talking about CMS, Atlas types, CERN types, you know, there's only a couple, maybe a couple at slightly lower energy in the US, but there's not many that are going to be able to produce these kind of outputs, right? Yeah, I would agree. Uh, yeah. So depending on the different kind, uh, accelerators are designed to produce a different kind of particles or to go for brute force, like the LAC, where you try to produce as many different kinds of particles as possible, so that people can discuss many, uh, discuss and study many different things. Um, yeah, maybe they're working. I on... think this was poetic logic. Yeah, or maybe they're working uh, on like the assumption that if if they think the Oxford particle accelerator is equivalent to the LHC like there are every like... university's got one there's the, the Birmingham University particle accelerator and the Leeds yeah. University particle accelerator I mean there's there, there are 60 or so other like equivalent light sources to diamond around the world so there, there are lots of them so maybe they're thinking oh all 60 of these are all colliders and they're all producing nonsense but like yeah for the most part they're all they're all light sources so they're trying to use the radiation instead of collide the stuff yeah, so, besides that, uh, just to give you some idea, there are some experiments that are trying to synchronize their running time. The famous one are the gravitational wave detectors, so LIGO and Virgo and now Kagra as well. Just getting these all to run at the same time, because these machines are quite tough to run and they have downtime and they all have beam day. And let's just convince everybody to do their beam day on the same day, yeah? <laughs> machine day. This is already... <laughs> So getting everybody to agree and to all run at the same time is already so difficult. <laughs> We'd like to have all these uh, all these yeah. particle colliders running around the world at the same time, but yeah, that doesn't necessarily yeah. work out. Now, now, Fred, they talk about science being broken. This this reminded me of um, something that happened sort of ten years ago. The the faster than light neutrinos. So they say in the show that these event displays that we've just seen that they show that. Particle physics and and science is broken. We can't understand what's going on in these in these particle collisions. So, 
what kind of things would we want to check at a at a particle physics experiment if we, if we started to see nonsensical output like this? What would be our what would be our process to go through to check that we were producing something that was uh, really something that we're observing? Well, particle physics experiments are all designed with lots of redundancy. Let's start with that so that you can cross check yourself. And typically, and also there is a sister experiment that yeah. does the same uh, same experiment. So the famous ones are, well, UA1 and UA2. We yeah. already discussed UA1. Uh, the next generation, we had uh, four experiments cross-checking each other. Then at the Tevatron, there were two, C0 and CDF. And now at the LHC, there's ATLAS and CMS. Uh, these experiments do exactly the same thing. So they should, even though they look at different collisions, they should be getting to the same conclusions and they but, do but with different technologies uh, and different analysis but with different technology things, yeah. with different people uh, with different software completely independent and so cross-checking is a tough job and not something you do straight away um the experiment you're showing here opera is a very nice example because this involves people shooting particles neutrinos from CERN. Yep. so there we counted how many we had to Transato, which is in Italy, close to Rome under a mountain, and then counted how much you had left there. And then somebody had a good idea to not just count how many you had, but also count how long it took to get there. Here are the neutrinos then, coming from CERN and yeah. being fired off to Italy for, for, this, uh, exactly. for this experiment. And what happened was when they, so the experiment was not designed for this. So this was sort of like, oh, this would be cool if we also checked this idea. And uh, then they checked it and they got, uh, a, they the first time they measured it, they got out that the neutrinos were traveling faster than the speed of light. And indeed, they really did a lot of cross checks. In the end, they did the scientific right thing, which is to bring it out and say, this is what we checked. And we still get this number. In the end, it turned out that one of the things they did not check was uh, what was causing it. Uh, but this is how the scientific process works. Sometimes you have puzzling events and then you ask feedback from the scientific community to see how to solve this. And you would definitely not use it as a case to shut things down. And I guarantee you that if that uh, anomaly would have stayed longer, people would have built another experiment to check. Yeah, so, this, so this, is, this is really because interesting. We never believe. Uh, in Dutch, you say one swallow uh, doesn't make it summer. Yeah, we um, have that. We, yeah, we, we have that too, yeah. I heard that depending on how far south you go, you go in Europe, um, it's uh, it doesn't make it spring this swallow. So they get the swallows earlier. <laughs> well, swallow and I also it. know that it originally comes from Greek. So, <laughs> it's, uh, so the the point is you need to cross check, and the fact that you get results that are not consistent with what you expect in many different places is actually really exciting, and definitely not a reason to shut things down. But also, if you see things that are not consistent, what you do is you start checking. You yeah. start using the redundancy. Is the particle moving through all layers of my detector? Did I measure it accurately when it started? Uh, so there's many different things you can check, and we do. So, so there's quite a nice, and they do get it right in the show, that they say they check the hardware, so they go in and check these you know the the blocky uh, the blocky things that we're detecting particles with. We're going to go in and check that they're working correctly. So we're going to go and yeah. check our magnets. We're going to check our detector elements in CMS, and then we're going to check the software that we actually do the analysis with. And they mention going through both of those steps because here, in as is the case with the Opera experiment, it was a a loose cable in the fiber optic timing system. So that's a hardware problem, but it could be that you're doing your analysis incorrectly and there's a minus sign somewhere in your analysis code. So you need to check the hardware, the stuff that's detecting these particles, and then your software, the stuff that's analyzing the, the output of that hardware, right? Exactly. Right. But this is also why that independence and having complementary yeah. experiments is so important. Because yeah. the software is also completely independent of the experiment. So when they mention, I don't know, are we going to go to the certain software now? We of course, that's it. that's what I was okay, going to jump into it. now. So, so they, so indeed the software. So we to give you some idea, just for our experiment, the software is uh, seven and a half million lines. We just checked this yesterday because I was wondering how much it was. So I'll just so I'll just I'll just flag this up for people. So they say, yeah. where's where's the line? Um, I'm going to try and find it. So. I think, uh, yeah, the image here right at the start, I think it was, 
Yes. So when all this faulty or, or strange output is coming, the character says, I went through the CERN code line by line and nothing. It was all perfectly fine. So Freya, you want to go off about the uh, the software now? Because that is not an easy task for her to have uh, done that. Yeah, exactly. So the CERN software, well, there is CERN software, of course, but all these software systems are completely independent. Um, to give you some idea, just software just for my experiment. And like I said, there's another experiment that's doing exactly the same thing. So I'm assuming they have the same uh, amount of software. Just our software is uh, seven and a half million lines of code. So you don't just do that. I actually calculated that it will probably take you 10 years to read that code. Um, the question is also how much you learn from just reading the code. Just skimming I, through a code. not yeah. the best way to debug a system is by reading code. Uh, yeah. Programmers, be aware, don't do that. And uh, what you do is you build systems. Uh, and uh, but the, it's not the... It's not a very realistic thing. No. Uh, these are very, very big softwares, and there are bound to be bugs in there, just like there's bugs in Zoom or in Facebook or in yeah. Hmm. This this idea of like Windows. A... This is how it works. Yeah. yeah the, but the idea of like, no. they're <laughs> they're complementary software. They can't all have the same bugs. Yeah. Yeah. This this idea of like a single central software. I I, I don't know if that is the case. At CERN, but like at least at Diamond, like every single beamline has all manner of like random scripts that run <laughs> each individual little thing. So to go through every single script for <laughs> every single bit of equipment, like for one thing, I don't think one single person would really understand that. No. Like, I mean, we have like engineering departments, the software department, the, the science software specific department, like. And I, yeah, I, I doubt any one person could verify that every single bit of code is working correctly. Not, not even just what it's doing, but it, it, different people write in different styles, and you know, mm. they, they haven't commented uh, their software. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's, uh, it's totally so. So for if we talked about centralized frame, maybe for CMS, you know, there is a CMS software stack, or for LHCB, there's yeah. a you know a software stack, but but within that, there's you know, people's personal, you know, trigger code, there's people's, there's, there's code that runs the analysis software, there's code that is, you know, for a particular detector, it's all fragmented underneath. You can't just go in and be like, you know, here's the 10 pages of code and I'm just going to skim through and see if there's any problems. It doesn't work like no, that. Like I said, the central software, so not individual people's code is seven and a half million. <laughs> so no on the, uh, the skimming the CERN <laughs> code. So, um, Right before we go off this, uh, Frey, I just wanted to to flag this up, and you sort of mentioned it already. But the in the show, they kind of say we're getting this nonsensical output, and therefore this experiment in Oxford and maybe others around the world are being shut down. Would this be the reaction of the scientific community? Because my reaction was this would be incredibly exciting, and everyone would be on this for weeks, and there would probably be new experiments built if we could find these signals of new physics that we're desperately looking for. I totally agree, Sam. <laughs> what can I say? This is, what keep, this is where we all went into science. Yeah. Uh, seeing something that is new and, uh, and getting them to study it is what we're, that's the business we're in. Uh, this is the most, uh, like I said, as far as unreal, unrealistic things, this is the most uh, unrealistic <laughs> thing. Yeah. Uh, Scientists saying want something because all the stars blink later. Yeah. <laughs> wow, true. Yeah, it's it's kind of odd because in the show they use that kind of the trope that we hear that kind of science has been stuck for sixty years, but they kind of use it backwards. It's we've now found something new, but now we're just going to shut everything down. It's kind of bizarre. Like, like I said, everyone would be all over this. This is new physics finally after that all that time. And let's uh, you know, let's study it. But instead, the the reaction in the show seems to be, oh, something's confusing. Shut it all down, which would be exactly the opposite of what we would see in the real life, right, Freya? Well, yeah. In the end, this is the MacGuffin, right? So this is what's driving the story. So I guess uh, as far as uh, uh, making good sci-fi, I understand. <laughs> uh, as far as science is concerned, I don't. Understand. Well, well, uh, maybe we'll find out later why uh, why that's happening. So we we restrict ourselves to. It's episode one. So 
So, Frey, I wanted to come on to this. So, in the scene in the Particle Collider, Vera Yi tragically decides to end her life by jumping from a platform in this room. So, she walks out of the controller, um, the control room for the accelerator, and she walks into this room, and she decides to dive down into the the water below. So, I think we've got a, a, a clip of that here for people. So she jumps down into this this water filled tank in this strange room. Where where is she, Freya? And does this make sense with the uh, continuity of the the show? Well, where she is is in a detector that looks very very similar to the Kamiokande detector in Japan. Yeah. So if she was an Oxford when she runs into the <laughs> door, we have a continuity problem. Um, now, of course, it might be that in this world there. It's such a detector in Oxford, and we can talk about that. Whether you could use a detector like this to look at collisions from an accelerator, I'm not so sure. That's something else. So what are these detectors for? These detectors are what they call water Cherenkov detectors, and they're there to see very, very, very rare collisions of typically particles that are not interacting at all, or very, very little, like neutrinos, or even dark matter, or very rare processes where there's very rare radioactivity. And then this one particle creates some light, and this you can see. And this is why this gigantic room is completely covered with these yellow balls on the edge. So those are the light detectors, which we call photomultipliers. So each of these could, in principle, if a single photon would be produced somewhere, could see it and which is why the whole room is covered in them and then you fill the whole room you fill with water very special water it's like super pure uh, very low mineral water and so that uh, there are is no are no elements to absorb this light so that the light can really travel through the deck so that so the neutrino comes in it interacts with one of the protons in the water produces these these rings of light which we can detect with those photomultipliers on the on the wall and then we can get the idea of wh where this light came from and the, and the the nature of the exactly. uh, the particle interaction and this is a nobel prize winning experiment mm. so this actually proved that neutrinos have mass in this experiment so it's really cool it's nice that it's in there and this is this is in uh, but it's not in oxford it's not in oxford so sam <laughs> is there just want to come back to you sam at, at diamond light is there a a massive underground uh Super Cameo Kande style experiment hiding uh, in yeah, the back it, room there? If it is, it's very well hidden because I've never <laughs> seen it. Uh, I, I do know that there is a dark matter research lab uh, also run by the Science and Technology Facilities Council um, up in uh, North Yorkshire. Yes. Uh, yes. Baldy, and I believe they have plans to build a detector like this. So the they're building it at the bottom of a mine. So it's actually sort of a mile underground. So the idea is... You've got all of that earth and rock, which gets rid of all the background radiation. And then you should sort of have your nice pure signal for doing your dark matter research mm. without any annoying background noise. So yeah, there's there's already a dark matter research lab there, but it's not one of these, but they're hoping <laughs> to build one. So nobody, uh, so a little bit of artistic license here. Nobody's wandering from Oxford to, uh, where is this? So Super Kamikandio is under Mount Akino in Japan. Nobody's wandering mm. there in a couple of seconds. I mean, it's even four and a half hours to drive up to North Yorkshire from <laughs> from uh, Diamond. So Exactly. And also in Japan, while famously having good public transportation, I think that this is really <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. Because you want these detectors to be in the middle of nowhere, because really every noise is annoying. And these, these things are supposed to really not of any radiation. That's why there are other mountains. Very, 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 very boring background. Nothing's supposed to be happening there. That's what <laughs> they find locations where there is no distraction, no radiation, no machines, nothing near them. Yeah, exactly right. So it looks like they were trying to, I mean, this is a very cool, iconic room, right? So I imagine they were just kind of trying to uh, collect these, uh, you know, doing a bit of magpieing and picking up these amazing, uh, these amazing very experiments. Pretty. It is very pretty. It's extremely pretty. Mm -hmm. So, so not very realistic there. And and Freya, that the the, uh, the character there, Vera Yi, she she leaps down into the water. So I think 
this tank is over 40 meters tall. So it is potentially a kind of a deadly fall down there into the into the water. But also the water inside there, they tell us, is very um, ultra pure. And potentially you wouldn't want to be going swimming around in this, right? Yeah, well, for one thing, it would affect the science because all your hair would make it less pure. You could look at that the other way around if you're a human. It's also not very nice to... It's dragging things out of your body and not good for you. It will leave <laughs> things out of you. Uh, uh, or potentially you will swell up and, uh, and uh, absorb all the water just by osmosis to make things... Uh, <laughs> uh, to make you consistent with the ultra pure water. So bad, so bad for the experiment because you're contaminating <laughs> the water. And bad, bad for, for you human. because... The, what yeah. what the experiment sees as a contaminant is the vitamins coming out of your skin and your hair into the water, which exactly. is so ultra pure. So bad for you, and uh, yeah, death, and bad for the death experiment. by osmosis does not sound pleasant. <laughs> yeah, so it's exactly. a it's a strange yeah. way to want to kill yourself. Like maybe the fall was deadly. She doesn't fall in a kind of professional diver's way. She just sort of dumps herself. So maybe uh, a deadly fall. But laying in that water is definitely not going to do you yeah. any good. I mean, the... sorry, Sam. Yeah. The so the actual uh, I'm not super familiar with the actual sort of build of this experiment, but like she goes up and stands on a platform and jumps into the water. But in your diagram, is the whole thing just filled with water? I think eventually is... the whole thing is filled. Yeah, so she. But wouldn't they really... do do maintenance when. Well, okay. So you can get in halfway. Yeah. Right. Okay. So this might be a sort of 20, 30 meter fall, which is potentially a bit, but, but I mean, Freya's right, just explained it, that when it's running, it will be totally filled. So you wouldn't be able to access. So I don't know how high the level of the water is, depending on how high it is, maybe a, maybe a deadly fall. But again, laying in this water for an extended period of time is not a good idea. And Freya, you flagged up that um, the people running this experiment wouldn't be particularly happy either with somebody diving in there in terms of the damage that would be done to the experiment yeah. so do you want to tell so, us a little bit about this image yeah yeah i can tell you a bit so this is an image it's the actual image from super kamiokanda so uh to give you some idea of what actually happens so there's a beautiful image in three body problem where she drive dives in and then you see this beautiful wave going over the surface yeah. of the of the of the water level of the water surface in this detector now these detectors they're so incredibly precise that the Photomultiplies need to be ridiculously thin to actually make sure that every uh, light particle, every photon that you have, that is is that it is detected. So that means that these balls, these yellow balls, are extremely thin glass, and that means uh, that and they're vacuum inside. Yeah. So that means they can crack easily, and it means that I guess they implode when, when they, they crack. crack right. They implode. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And. Super Kamiokande actually had an incident where one of them spontaneously cracked and every photomultiplier underneath the water level got essentially imploded just from the shockwave. Ah, so the pressure was transferred through the fluid yeah. and through the water and affected exactly. all the Exactly. So this is what you see here as well. If you, uh, you can see that halfway in the image, you can see where the photomultipliers are still whole. Yeah. where they're broken so those are the broken ones so, that, the so these are these are whole. okay and then these are all yeah. broken down below and here. these there's a horizontal line which is where the water level was ah. yeah. <laughs> so this is what happened there it's an extremely tragic accident that set them back back for many years and actually got to the point that they these photomultipliers are also custom made so you can't just go to the photomultiplier yeah. store to buy photomultipliers <laughs> the photomultiplier and store okay. there is a photomultiplier store <laughs> okay they do nothing but make these but they don't make these specific ones so unless you ask them not, not on the high street you... these are special particle physics stores but yes exactly. okay good and uh, so what happened was they actually Ended up like sort of redistributing the photomultipliers that they still have ah, okay. all over the detector to be able to continue to do science. <laughs> and uh, but this is something that actually happened in the real world, and and that affected a lot of scientists. Uh, so don't jump into. So don't jump into the pool for recreation, or definitely not for killing <laughs> yeah. yourself. Because don't do it. Lots for of many uh, lots of bad implications. So. Maybe a, maybe a deadly fall, but a very strange way to want to kill yourself and would also damage the experiment. And if you didn't die, you would die very horribly from having all of these uh, minerals leached out of you. So when they're doing maintenance, you see these very famous pictures. They go out on these uh, these rubber dinghies and they have these uh, 
these rubber suits on to stop the water getting getting onto them. So they take this very, very seriously. It's even more than that, it's mostly so they don't drop any hair into the water. Right? But, yeah, <laughs> and, and vice versa, yeah. yeah. I'm surprised he doesn't have to wear um, a beard net, actually. Probably uh, the famous beard net. I might be able to see that. Yeah. So, Super Cameo Kande making uh, an appearance potentially not, not so good. Um, I can't add much to this, but maybe uh, maybe you can, Sam. So the uh, <laughs> satellite dish that, that kills lots of birds. So we see a huge satellite dish later in the show. Um, which is being used to communicate, apparently, with uh, whoever is out there or whatever is out there. It seems to attract lots of birds. They smack into mm. it and they die. Any idea what's what's going on here? You mentioned that this is the probably the most bizarre way to uh, get a, uh, a lifetime position in science is uh, being yeah, converted I mean, off to Mongolia. Yeah, I mean, like get, getting a permanent job in science is pretty difficult. But <laughs> yeah, I've never heard of someone going sort of political prisoner into permanent science permanent job. Science so role. It's it's an option, I guess. Um, it's a well known track. Well known track. <laughs> I think there's only one place in the world where that could potentially yeah. be a track presently yeah. and that's North Korea. We don't really know what happened. Yeah, true. <laughs> any yeah, I mean, any ideas on this one, Sam? Because uh, I'm out of my biological depth here, I think. Yeah, I mean, most of my biology is with like proteins. Like, I don't really work with uh, <laughs> full animals, but it's a it's fairly common like science trope of, you know, sci-fi kills all the birds. So yeah. like uh, dark um stranger things yeah. um a film called flash forward yeah. they all they all involve mass bird death <laughs> so i did some googling around this um so in dark at least some people theorize that there was some sort of um shockwave that burst all the birds eardrums and okay. then that caused them to lose balance and crash and die um there was actually a case in hyderabad in 2021 where the temperature got to 47 degrees and they they think that all all these birds died because of like exhaustion and the high temperature. Um, there was another case in Arkansas where five thousand birds died uh, on New Year's Eve because of a fireworks display that spooked them and caused them all to fly very low in the dark and crash. Um, but yeah, in terms of this experiment, like I'm not sure what they would be broadcasting maybe they mess with the magnetic field because a lot of birds yeah. navigate yeah by sensing magnetic fields um but yeah as as the owner of two cockatiels uh the, the <laughs> amount of bird death in sci-fi is uh is alarming to say the least <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm not really sure what could be going it doesn't really make sense for it to be sound right if they if they want to uh if they want no. to communicate out into the universe obviously that's going to end but as soon as the, guess... the air gets thin but Earlier on in the episode, they mentioned that like all the security guards have lost their hair, and yeah. so I don't know. Maybe they're like broadcasting some sort of radiation, but I don't know why you'd how you'd do that from a satellite dish. Um, yeah, obviously a very dramatic scene, but scientifically a complete mystery. Freya, can you add anything? I I, I don't know much about this. It's, I think this is just pure no. science fiction here. It no. looks good. It looks good, and that's about it. All right, moving on then. So, the final scene of the show, because we need to we need to finish off quite quickly, is um, this blinking star. So, in the scene, um, they look up at the stars. And, uh, the stars wink back. The universe is said to wink back. So, any thoughts on how this could happen, Sam? We've got the uh, the stars seem to be blinded out for people all around the world all i could think of was the kind of uh simpsons dome over the top that's that's going on what yeah i mean like obviously all of those stars are such different distances away like yeah. a, lo a lot of those stars are possibly already dead and we're yeah. still just seeing their final light um so, so like <laughs> turning them off at their source doesn't really make any sense because yeah the light's already it left they're still hot it must be something close that's doing that. Yeah. Right? The only sense. way it could work is, yeah, something in our atmosphere. Uh, I don't know. Maybe aliens are messing with the density of the ionosphere or the troposphere or something and, like, stopping all light suddenly coming through. Um, yeah. 
It only makes sense for it to be a a close change. Freya, any, you want to have any wild swings at this one? uh, (laughs) Not really. I will say that uh, indeed, I totally agree with what Sam said. Uh, This can only be very close because it uh, it affects everything to uh, pay homage to another uh, sci-fi franchise set in Oxford. It might be dust. Who knows? Fair enough. Good. Now, one thing I did notice from the from the science of this, and this was picked up by some of our Astro friends um, as well, was that in the images that they show to give it a little bit more, um, you know, sexy sci-fi license, we see these these four points on the stars. Now, when you look up at the stars, you don't see stars with these four points, these four diffraction spikes. You just you just see dots for the for the most. They might be a bit fuzzy, but you usually see dots or a little bit of twinkling. Now, why are we seeing these four dots? Well, because these are due to the um, the optics of the of uh, telescopes like Hubble and JWST. So, because of the optics of Hubble, you get these four these four points. You know, it's a Fourier transform or whatever of the. Uh, of the optics. And then with JWST, you get these, um, this more kind of starry shape. So because of the uh, setup of JWST and Hubble, and because of the optics that they use, you get these diffraction spikes. So for JWST, you get the six points. And for Hubble, you get the four points. So here they've actually used uh, what seems to be a kind of Hubble image to make it a little bit sexier to display the stars, but you would never see stars like this actually in uh, with your eyes because the optics that you're using your eyes are completely different, right? I don't know if either of you picked up on that when you were watching. Yeah, I mean di- diffraction is obviously something very near and dear to me as a crystallographer, <laughs> um, but yeah, obviously, uh, I don't know. I, I mean, for one thing, like center of oxford which is where this appears to be this looks like maybe christchurch college or something like that they have yeah that's similar, what i thought it was. i thought it was quads. trinity in cambridge but if they're in oxford maybe they kept at oxford so i'll i'll, I'll bow to you guys greater wisdom yeah on that. like it I mean, looks so very much... christchurchy okay yeah so much light pollution you're never going to be able to see this for one thing <laughs> true that's a good point um, I, hadn't, I hadn't thought of that yes that's also another good point so probably wouldn't be able to see things this clearly and um, no diffraction spikes because we're not Hubble Space Telescope. Okay. Yeah. Good. Right. So I guess let's bring it to let's bring it to a summary. So there's been plenty of science to chew on in that first episode of Three Body Problem. So as we wrap up, Freya, I'm going to come to you first. How would you rate the scientific rigor of what we've seen in uh, in episode one? You you told me that there was a scientific advisor on this yeah there was uh, a colleague of ours uh, from uh, uh, university of cambridge was actually the scientific advisor and he's a working particle physicist cambridge lhcb uh, think... so my experiment LHCB. at my university i have to be i have to be quite careful with what i'm going to say <laughs> so i'm going to let you guys talk more you know now of course how dave and dan then <laughs> interpret it and how, how the it how the uh, cs CGI team then goes with that something else. Of course. I think that in general, as far as scientific uh, accuracy is concerned, as a particle physicist, I'm delighted there compared to many other things. This is really not bad. It can be a lot worse. <laughs> a lot worse. It's not so, too bad. When you see an event display in something bad. and it's not absolutely yeah. awful, that, that's a pretty good start. Yeah, I would go with not too bad. So not perfect, but not too bad. Not perfect, but not good too bad. Yeah. So, so Matt, Matt Kenzie, who worked in it from Cambridge on HCB, good job, right? Not, not, not bad. Of course, it goes out of your hands once you've done the, uh, you know, the scientific uh, advice, but, but not too bad. Sam, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it gets a zero on the accurate representation of DNA, um, but <laughs> I don't know. I think for for my side of the science for it like the it it also scores fairly low because like diamond is a completely different beast to what they're representing like it 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 can't do these experiments so they've kind of taken the word particle accelerator and assumed that they're all the same um 
which they're obviously not. So in terms of accurate representation of a synchrotron light source, they're completely off. And in terms of particle physics, like I am a biologist in physicist's clothing. Like I did a biochemistry degree. I ended up working at various particle accelerators, but uh, yeah, most particle physics is beyond me. <laughs> so we're, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna echo what Fresh and said. Decent, not too bad, um, but not perfect. There's some uh, there's some work to do. Give us give us the job, yeah. and we'll uh, we'll help you out <laughs> some more. That's the that's exactly what we're gonna say. yeah exactly. Yeah. Poetic license will happen. Just talk. Well, yeah, you're a biologist. Any outbreak will be evil. Teach us <laughs> humility as physicists. And all us physicists become biologists during pandemic. Well, <laughs> a lot, a lot do that I've seen. So I've seen that. I've seen that happen as well. So final, final question. I know we've got to close up in the next in the next couple of minutes. So one of the towards the very end of this show, <laughs> uh, Benny Wong's character Clarence Shi claims that it's a shit time to be a scientist. The floor is open for final comments on this. Sam, maybe I come to you first. Shit time to be a scientist? Question it's, mark. Yeah, I mean, it's a especially for in the wake of like the coronavirus pandemic. Like to be a, a biologist at this time, like the amount of disinformation around like vaccines and all that sort of stuff. Like the yeah, it's um, it's trying. I will say to kind of see the amount of like to see um, an actual measles outbreak happen in yeah. the US when it should be a thing of the past like in terms of that it's yeah it's difficult to be a scientist um in terms of being like a structural biologist uh the like the technology at diamond has now advanced so far that we can determine a protein structure in a matter of hours whereas it used to be sort of a full phd or a full postdoc project for many years you'd get your one structure that would be your phd whereas now we've got the mm. protein data bank with two hundred thousand structures of proteins and we've got so many structures to the point it's now feeding into ai and alpha fold is predicting structures yeah. which is another challenge for structural biology so yeah it's um mixed bag i would so, say so in terms of the technology and and, and moving forward very strong, very good. But in terms of the the interaction with society, maybe maybe a little bit challenging at the at the current time. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's like the the loudest voice is sort of the most represented on social media. Of like course, you yeah. you see all of the people spreading their kind of pseudoscience, and it's a lot of the time you you can't even bother engaging with it because you end up going down a rabbit hole, and they're never going to be convinced anyway. Mm. So you just kind of have to see it and either choose to go down that rabbit hole or ignore it <laughs> so yeah it's definitely a difficult time in that respect freya shit time to be a scientist question mark well i think he's pointing to the fact that all these people are dying by the way so that that's sense, i agree that's with true. it but uh, i'm not so sure but then i'm actually an optimist so this helps uh <laughs> Uh, they, 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 lots of people out there saying challenges. we're struggling yeah. in particle physics and things like this what, what do you make yeah, of that? this is i think that's uh yeah i mean so um i think particle physics is alive and well just like many other fields we we measure the shit out of stuff and that's what scientists do we measure things uh, <laughs> and we measure things that are interesting and that other people want to know so we're not we're not as pessimistic as uh, as Benny here. Obviously, there's uh, no. there's horrible things going on in the show, but in general, in the world, science is in a you know we're mm. happy to be scientists. So uh, yeah, we'll I wonder how I think much so, this... being a scientist is a fantastic job. It's uh, it ticks so many boxes for for a desirable job, which is why so many people want to be a scientist. Yeah. At the same time, yeah, science in the age of disinformation does have a responsibility to talk about the scientific methods and how we prove things and yeah. this is why we talk about measuring and about how things are really do are done and that's and how why we try to excite people to show them how amazing science exactly. is using jump offs like this uh this <laughs> fascinating show sam did you want to close us up because i know we have to we have to shut down now yeah i mean i was just wondering like how this um how the the term scientist applies here because like Obviously, I work at a particle accelerator, but I'm nothing to do with hard particle physics. Like, are there 
random biologists who have used a particle accelerator seeing numbers in front of their eyes like the uh, the main yes. characters we're going to find out we're going to find yeah. out yeah. one of the main characters is actually a nanoscientist so. true yeah so do so, you just have to have worked at a particle accelerator and suddenly you're possibly going to be afflicted with this uh... I'm, I'm seeing them right now Sam. I, I don't know what you what you are looking at right <laughs> well, what's your number at how close to zero I, I'm not, I can't I can't possibly <laughs> tell you Awesome. Right. I, I know um, I know you guys have got a hard cut off. I've got a hard cut off as well. So I'd like to thank you so much for taking the time today. I really, really enjoyed going through that with you. Um, Freya, Sam, I'm going to make sure your work and your socials are down below. Um, and thank you again so much. I don't know if you want to say anything to close. Freya, do you want to say anything to close us up? I think it's not a shift time to be a scientist. <laughs> I think that's a... That's a good place to leave it. So I've heard just uh, before we finish that the show kind of goes downhill in terms of scientific rigor after this. So we'll we'll keep an eye on that. Maybe we'll get back together and do, uh, you know, a couple mm -hmm. of episodes later on, depending on what we uh, what we see in those episodes. But I kind of enjoyed the show. I'm intrigued to watch a little bit more. And there's plenty of science in there to get your your teeth into. So I hope you enjoyed this discussion. Thank you again to my guests. And uh, let's talk again soon, guys. Sounds good. Awesome. Thank you Bye. very much. Have a lovely day. Bye. Bye now. I want to know what you think, because you're the scholars of enlightenment that I do this for. So please take a moment, if you wish, to let me know down in the comment section. And if you like this video, please consider leaving a like, subscribing, setting up notifications, and sharing this video more widely. I can't tell you how much these simple actions help me out and how much I'd appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being scientific. Thanks for being bad.